The name Rockefeller is synonymous with the term Baron of Industry. But how much do you know about Rockefeller's lifestyle? Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring the events that led John D. Rockefeller to live a relatively modest lifestyle while he was the wealthiest man in the United States. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. John D. Rockefeller had a rough start to life. He was one of six children in a home run by his mother, Eliza. His father, William, had all but abandoned his family in New York. William was originally a lumberman, but found more money was to be made in deceiving people. He paraded about the country as a botanic physician, selling snake oil and elixirs to cure every disease. With the money he made, he would seek out desperate farmers, lend them money with steep interest, then buy their farms at auction when they would inevitably be foreclosed on. Eliza tried to shield her children from William's ways. She was a devout Baptist who believed in hard, honest work. All of her children did regular chores around the house and got jobs to help make ends meet. Eliza was known for telling her children, Willful waste makes woeful want. To the contrary, William was quoted as saying, I cheat my boys every chance I get. I want to make them sharp. With parents who were extreme opposites, we can start to understand how the young mind of John D. Rockefeller was molded into the robber baron he would become. As a young boy, John worked to help his mother. He raised turkeys and sold produce, pitching in for bills. In 1853, his family moved to Ohio where he would finish high school and attend a business course at Folsom's Commercial College, receiving training to become a bookkeeper. At the age of 16, he became an assistant bookkeeper for a produce commission firm. He was a natural at this job and was quickly given other responsibilities, including negotiating transportation rates. It was here that he learned that no prices were set, that you could always negotiate if you were dealing with a large enough order. By 1859, at the age of 20 years old, he took everything he learned from his job and set out to build his own produce commission business. He joined efforts with his friend, Maurice Clark, to raise $4,000, or the modern-day equivalent of about $140,000, to start their business. Maurice invested $2,000 of his own money, while John invested his life savings of $800. He asked his father for a loan of $1,000, which William gladly did, charging his son 10% interest. Though at the time, the interest on the loan seemed like a lot of money to John. It was a risk worth taking. In the first year alone, John profited about $17,000, or the modern-day equivalent of about $600,000, and was able to pay off the loan without any trouble. Then the American Civil War broke out and demand for food skyrocketed as Union troops headed to battle. Supplying food to the Union Army made John quite wealthy, but he was still nowhere near his prime. As the Civil War raged on, John became aware that his government contract would not last forever. Being rather observant, he had noticed an increase in demand for oil, specifically kerosene for lighting buildings. He began looking into the process of oil production and saw an industry wrought with waste. Pumps would fill creeks with oil, men paling out what they wanted, and the rest being wasted as if though it were water. Then he saw how the oil was refined, with nearly half of the oil being turned to waste. At this time, in 1862, oil was going for as much as $13.75 per barrel, or the modern-day equivalent of about $403 per barrel. John started to strategize a more efficient system. He sold his business partner Clark on the idea, and they brought a chemist by the name of Samuel Andrews on board to help them out. The trio figured out how to run the most efficient refinery in the country by creating new products out of the waste. They sold petroleum jelly, paraffin wax, and lubricating oil in addition to kerosene. The company did not outsource any of its work, but chose to hire people to do everything in-house, which allowed them to price their oil at nearly half of the national average. John bought out Clark's stake in the company and reformed a partnership with Samuel Andrews and Henry Morrison Flagler, naming the firm Rockefeller, Andrews, and Flagler. By the following year, the refinery had become the largest in the world. In 1870, Rockefeller broke off by himself and formed the Standard Oil Company, quickly becoming the largest refinery in Ohio. He began to take note of his father's business practices by threatening other refineries. He would offer to buy them out, and if they refused, he would drop the price of his oil so low that he would take a loss. The low prices would drive customers to him, and his competition would go bankrupt at which point he would purchase their businesses at foreclosure auctions. The business was now expanding into other states, some of which did not allow non-residents to own companies within their borders. So he started the Standard Oil Trust in 1882 to act as a holding company and provide a loophole to continue business in other states. 
This gave him control of 90% of the nation's oil, making him the wealthiest man in the United States with a net worth around $1 billion, or the modern day equivalent of about $29 billion. With this money, he relocated his headquarters to New York City in 1884 and purchased a house at number 4, 54th Street in Manhattan. The Italianate brownstone had been built 20 years earlier. The house rose four stories above ground and was considered to be a rather humble residence compared to the limestone palaces of the Vanderbilt and Astor families just around the corner. Upon seeing the house, John immediately liked everything about it, including its now outdated decor. He purchased the home fully furnished, not making any changes other than adding a few area rugs to the rooms. Here, John and his wife Laura would raise their children the way John's mother had raised him. Unlike his wealthy neighbors, he did not employ a large staff. His children were responsible for doing chores and cleaning up after themselves, and Laura was known to clean, cook dinner, and do dishes. Newspapers reported on this phenomena, as the wealthiest family in the country were not weighted on hand and foot like all of their neighbors. This is quite incredible, as we are about to see just how large this house was. Stepping inside, you would pass through double doors with stained glass panels to arrive in the entrance hall complete with old-growth wood wainscoting, elaborate door frames, and hand-milled crown molding. Next to the front door was an ingle nook, containing an elaborately carved wood relief set above a mantel with a bay window to the side. As you continue on, you would pass below a hand-stenciled ceiling before arriving at the stair landing, with intricately carved wood paneling now going from floor to ceiling. As you would begin to look around, you would see the fluted newel posts capping off the ornate banisters. Following the diagonal details, leading your eyes upwards, your gaze would continue up the four-story atrium and rest on the arcade composed of fluted Doric columns, hand-carved from old-growth wood porting highly detailed arches. Here you would see the underside of each ascending balcony, finished out in a neat grid of wood paneling. Before we make our way upstairs, let's turn around and head back towards the front door and enter the opening to the side. This takes us into the parlor. Here we find a floor-to-ceiling fireplace with scenes from antiquity carved into its lower mantle. Its upper mantle was dominated by three mirrors, with maidens hand-painted in the upper corners. All of this was set against oversized baseboards and wallpaper. Above the picture rail, in the frieze, was a mural that spanned the length of the room. And above all of this, on the ceiling, was a mural surrounded by hand-stenciled panels. Passing through the opening, we would arrive in the Moorish smoking room with canonical corbels brightly colored and popping out of the frieze above damask wallpaper. The wainscoting below took on a Moorish pattern with pointed arches sweeping above the floor. Continuing through the opening at the end of this room, we would pass into the dining room, our line of sight being dominated by another floor-to-ceiling fireplace, but this time carved from stone boasting five inlaid mirrors on its upper mantle. The ceilings above were coffered with layers of dentil molding set against a hand-painted floral pattern in the ceiling's panels. Beyond the dining room was the kitchen, where we could imagine Mrs. Rockefeller cooking meals and doing dishes with her kids. It was equipped with state-of-the-art appliances and featured a separate pantry with a double sink and floor-to-ceiling storage. Heading upstairs, we would arrive in the upper stair hall, where we can look through the archways at the floating staircase, the exterior wall being punctured with several different shapes of windows. Continuing towards the front of the house, you would arrive in Mr. Rockefeller's bedroom foyer, proudly displaying a portrait of himself below the coffered ceiling. Continuing between columns, you would glance out across the bedroom decorated with layers of wallpaper and featuring a hand-stenciled ceiling from which a kerosene chandelier was suspended. To one side of the room, below ornate fretwork, was the dressing room, complete with windows to allow more natural light to flood the space. To the other side of the room was the private ensuite. It boasted an east-lake mirror set above an oversized vanity. This room also doubled as a closet, as we can notice the armoire set to the side. Continuing through one of the doors in the bathroom would bring you to the gravity toilet butted up against the bathtub and joined by the same wood paneling set against encaustic wall tile. As time went on in this house, John and Laura celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. But just a few months later, in 1915, Laura died of a heart attack. John, distraught by her passing, left the house and locked the doors never to return retiring to his vacation house. He allowed both his church and the YMCA to use the home without charge, including allowing the YMCA to create 50 dorms on the upper floor for underprivileged women needing shelter. Later, during World War I, he opened the house to the American Red Cross and had supplies sent to the volunteers to aid in their efforts. He passed away in 1937, 
having given away over half of his fortune to charities in the years since his wife had passed. The house was left to his children, who viewed it as outdated. They attempted to sell the architectural elements as salvage, but no buyers could be found, so they had the house razed to the ground. The site is now occupied by a sculpture garden owned by the Museum of Modern Art, but not everything was lost. John's children had disassembled two rooms in the house before its demolition. Mr. Rockefeller's bedroom and dressing room were donated to the Museum of the City of New York, and the Moorish smoking room was reassembled in the Brooklyn Museum. Today, both rooms can be seen reassembled with their original furnishings in each museum. Thank you all for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Which room was your favorite? Make sure to let me know down below in the comments section. While you're there, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to take a moment to say a special thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.